Is this thing on? Yesterday's price is not today's price. Yeah, hello. This is CJ Gustafson back with another episode of the Run the Numbers podcast. And we are going to jump into a discussion I had with Kyla Scanlon, who creates excellent content online in and around the economy and more specifically the Federal Reserve, which I think is extremely confusing. And so she makes me a lot smarter on what's going on there. And we get into how it impacts running startups. So how do interest rates and the speed of the economy impact what we do day in and day out in the trenches. But before we do, I wanted to do a quick mail bag question. Today's question comes from Brendan Emery. What up, Big B? And he asks, CJ, sometimes it's hard to know if the business is going forward or going backwards relative to the economy. What are some early indicators that there could be underlying softness in my business? This is a really good one, and it's relevant to the pod that we'll get into today. So I'm going to give you my list. People just love lists. The Forbes fraud, 30 under 30. The I don't know. There are a lot of lists out there people like. I've never really been on one, but that's okay. But I'm going to give you a list of how to identify if your company is potentially going through a downturn. It's a list of early indicators to see if there's softness so you can take action. Number one. New higher salaries are changing faster than pipeline growth. And so when times are good, it's a candidate's market. And companies are super happy to lean in if it means they can land top talent. But when times are bad, people will suck it up and stay in the same roles they're in longer. And they're less demanding about the comp packages that they want to ask for. But shifts in the labor market always lag company performance. One has to come before the other. And You may identify or feel like you're in this awkward in-between period where you start to notice that you're hiring people at, say, $10,000 or $15,000 or even $20,000 more than you had budgeted. And so you're still going up to meet those candidate demands, but it doesn't really feel comfortable anymore. You start to get that queasy feeling in your stomach, given the day-to-day conversations you're having elsewhere in the business. So uh, you could call it a vibe. Kylie uses this term vibe session, which we'll, we'll define in length. You call it a premonition, but when that happens, you have to measure the rate of change in average salary. I do it by department, and I compare that to the rate of change in pipeline growth rate, which is kind of a proxy for how well we think the opportunity in the next few months from a top-line perspective looks. The next thing here to identify softness in your business is if you see multi-product attached plateauing or, or even dropping. And so shrink is what I call churns somewhat less ugly cousin. And so if multi-product expansion is a big driver to your net retention rate, you could be in for a pretty rude awakening if customers not only don't buy those additional modules or new licenses, but they rationalize one of your products for another. And that happens at a lot of startups. And this is a hard thing to do, but you have to be honest that, you know, like most families, I think every company has a favorite sibling or product. And when customers like you, but they can't afford the same wallet chair anymore, that that sibling or product who was loved up in good times will have to go. So they won't turn from you entirely, but they no longer can have six products with you and they rationalize one for the other. Number three, customers are downgrading to cheaper plans. So I've actually done this myself as a CFO sometimes. So not all features are economically resistant in the same way. So when times are good, customers, they won't blink an eye to take your higher price bells and whistles premium quote unquote plan. And the starter plan, it's going to sell a lot better in recessions. And a lot of those people who are on that premium plan may not need, you know, the ability to X, Y, Z in 10 seconds versus 20 seconds. That now feels like overkill when budgets start to tighten. Number four here, the velocity of early renewals is slowing. And this can be a scary one if your business is built on the back of early renewals. And this will be when customers want to buy an additional product and it'll just make sense to you know co-term all the products together or the customer is growing faster than they had anticipated and they need more licenses or usage. So as an example, I've come back to Snowflake and said, listen, I ate up all my usage here. I, I need to come back to you before the term is over and do a, an early renewal with a larger contract. But if customers stop showing up at your door to renew those products three to four months ahead of time anymore, there's a good chance your expansion pipeline will suffer. Or even worse, you could be sitting on a bunch of churn eggs that have not hatched yet. Just 
a side note, maybe some advice. I think the worst thing you can do is force customers into early renewals by overly discounting that. You're really mortgaging tomorrow's future just to pull forward cash today. And it's not worth the long-term trade-off if times are looking like they're going to be okay. I think you should only discount the renewal if it's actually the renewal time or if they will churn entirely for a competitor. Reason number I lost track. I think five. Customers are no longer buying multi-year deals that ramp in size. So when customers feel less certain about their futures, they'll stop committing long-term and embedding estimated growth to get a slightly better deal. And that's because either A, these deals usually require upfront payment at the start of each calendar year, and companies are now more conscious about their cash balances. So they're checking out their cash balances and saying, eh, I don't know if I want to give you more cash upfront for like 3% better discounting. Or B, they don't think they'll hire as many people as they originally might have thought, and therefore they don't need to pre-purchase licenses that will sit on the shelf. The next one I got for you here, quick hitter, registration volume is dropping. Registration volume dropping, that's really a precursor to conversion rates dropping, which can be scary because conversion rates are a function of registration volume times quality of registrations is all the quants will say. So if the top of the inbound funnel is tightening, reps will have to chase crappier quality leads to try to hit their quotas. The next one, former slam dunk deals are hitting the deal desk for discounting. And you may be walking around the office like, hmm, we've never really had to discount the mid-marking banking sector before. And that could be an anecdotal observation you might hear in the sales bullpen, which may unearth a larger trend. And I think every company has this customer segment that's really their white hot center. And I've worked at a company before where we could literally throw up a no look shot from the parking lot and swish it if it was a mid market neo bank and it would go in. But if you start to see that same customer segment getting discounts or come across the discount desk that you didn't before, you should really dig into it. The next one I got for you here is rep average call volume per deal is increasing. So this is a super activity-based metric that you're going to have to get into the weeds to monitor, but I like to look at it on a monthly basis because it's a leading indicator and a derivative of sales cycle length. So more calls per deal usually indicate more steps in the approval process and more scrutiny going into each deal. And most companies are obsessed with the number of days it it takes to close a deal, but less concerned with the activity-based metric. Like I said, that's at the rep level. And you can get closer to what is going on by looking at the rep call volume and how many calls it's taking to close a deal. And the next one I got for you here, effective commission rates are climbing. And we touched on this a bit with Ryan Walsh from RepView in a previous pod. We're now seeing this as a result of hiring during COVID. So talent was more expensive and reps and SMB were getting mid-market comp packages. They were kind of creeping up and getting paid more. But the deal sizes they're taking down in the post-COVID era, they start to shrink, right? So nevertheless, the amount they're making per deal stayed the same. So the amount the company is paying out per deal is rising. And at the end of each period, you should really benchmark your commission rate. And that's the entire stack. And if you start to pay out an entire stack that's, say, greater than 12%, you're probably getting over your skis. And remember, like the simple back of the envelope that you can do is just total cash commission payout for the period over total ARR additions to the new ARR. And the last one, and maybe the most important one in the list, I think we did 10 here, but you can keep me honest at home. Customers are paying you slower, okay? In my opinion, this is the easiest way to determine if you're in a downturn. Are your customers taking longer to give you the cash they owe you? This will punch you in the nose if they are, and businesses might hold on to their capital, delaying payments to suppliers, vendors, until they have more clarity on their own financial situation. And if you see an average of day sales outstanding DSO shoot up from, say, like 32 days to 47, something is in the water. Something is going on. Some advice. If they're nice enough to ask you for more time and don't just stiff you, just keep in the back of your mind that some customers might deliberately actually be negotiating longer payment terms to improve their own liquidity, even if they don't even need it. So they're using the economic situation to their advantage, but don't hate the player, hate the game. You can consider this too. If times are bad, never let a good crisis go to waste. Try to negotiate better payment terms. So that's what I got for you today. Some early indicators you can absorb, some early indicators you can look at to detect if your company may be going through a downturn. Enjoy this convo I had with Kyla. She does awesome work and I learn what the Fed does. Oh, and I learn which chairman of the Fed could do the most push-ups. So stay tuned. Thanks. Five stars, five stars.
Kyla, welcome to the Run the Numbers podcast, the number two business management podcast in Uganda. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That's a fun fact. Yeah. Well, I got to say off the bat, congrats on getting a word in the dictionary. That's got to be a major bucket list item. And you actually joined Beyonce as someone who got their own word. So pretty cool company to be in. I got to ask you, though, what is a vibe session? Wait, what was Beyonce's word in the dictionary? I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that. Based on, my, based on, no, I know it, but I didn't want to say it. Based on my extensive research, the word she got in the dictionary was bootylicious. Okay. Okay. Wow. In Merriam Webster or dictionary.com? Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah. No, I think Riz was the word of the year for this year. So you can really make anything a word. But the vibe session is the idea of a disconnect between consumer sentiment and economic data. So the general idea is like there's, something going on in the economy. The economy can be doing relatively okay and people can still feel pretty pretty bad about it. And the Vibe Session is just exploring why consumer sentiment would be really negative when the economy is mostly okay. That's kind of the body of research. And I'm feeling that as well because I'm seeing all these stats like, you know, Walmart has great consumer earnings and stuff. And then tech is doing layoffs and Unemployment is apparently doing well, but then there are all these other things that people are complaining about. So there definitely seems to be like a disconnect between like my mental attitude of what's going on and uh, what's actually going on. Yeah. So it's really difficult. I think what's most emblematic, and this isn't a broad brush to paint across, like there's actual hard economic realities. And I try to get that across because people hear vibe session and they're like, oh yeah, the vibes are why I can't pay my rent. And it's like, that's (laughs) not really what that means. It just means like on an aggregate that consumer sentiment is disconnected from economic data. Like there's actual real hard economic realities that people are facing, you know, health insurance is a nightmare. We're in the middle of a housing crisis. There are rolling recessions like in the tech industry, tech overhired, tech is expensive. Those people have to go And like, we're starting to see that happen now. I think one example that's really emblematic of that is there is on Twitter, a main character of the day. I don't know if you saw it, the Blue Main Onions guy who got Outback Steakhouse. So this guy gets Outback Steakhouse delivered to his house and, you know, it's a steak, Blue Main Onions, the whole nine yards. And he's like, it cost me $125 to get Outback Steakhouse DoorDash to me. Like the economy is in shambles. And I think that that tweet was so emblematic of how people feel about the economy because like, number one, you're getting DoorDash steak. Like (laughs) you're having a steak (laughs) delivered to you. Like that's something that a modern king would like freak out about. And so I think that that tweet just really shows how people's economic conceptions have gotten sort of subsidized by affluence, right? So we've had this zero interest rate environment for so long where it was normal to get a steak DoorDash to your house, but like that's not really a normal thing. And we're starting to see labor costs rise. So it is more expensive to get a steak DoorDash to your house. And I think people are just recalibrating to a new economic normal where things that were subsidized by VC money are no longer as accessible as they once were. You see the same thing with like Uber and Airbnb, people complaining about that online. Like, look how expensive this is. Like Airbnb with the cleaning fees that have yeah. just become completely exorbitant. And that's because their experience is being subsidized. It's like, can this be a standalone business by itself in the long run? Yeah, I think that's the thing. The Financial Times wrote this really good piece on this last year talking about affluent subsidization. But I think that that is a hard part about the economy is labor costs have risen. Lower income consumers have experienced wage growth for the first time in a really long time. And so we're starting to see goods and services that were normally very cheap become more expensive. And one could point to corporate price gouging as the reason, like, why should these wage increases be passed off to consumers? Like, shouldn't the companies just absorb them? But of course, we all know, like, we live in a... (laughs) society and that's not going to happen. And so I think that's the big thing that people are just calibrating to. And of course, like I said earlier, and just to reiterate, there are hard economic realities, but I think that a lot of people are adapting to a world where we're not in zero interest rate environments and that's a completely different world to exist in. And that's a good segue about the zero interest rate environments to talking a little bit about the Fed. And, you know, I'm a startup CFO and I, it pains me to say this publicly, I know pretty much zero about how the interest rates are determined that have an impact on my business. And the Fed is kind of thought about it as this mysterious, yet also kind of boring wizard behind this curtain, and they move the bank rates. So could you explain for listeners what the Fed actually does day to day and and also why you're so fascinated with it? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Fed is so interesting because they dictate economic reality to a certain extent. 
And so the Fed is sort of like the money wizard. I think wizard is a fun word for them. So they'll look around the economy and they'll be like, how's it doing? Like, what's inflation at? What's the labor market at? They have this dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment. So basically, they want to make sure that inflation is not ripping people's faces off. And they want to make sure that if you want a job, you can get a job. And so they'll influence rates in the economy to achieve that goal. That's one of their tools in their toolkit. They also have a balance sheet that they manage to make money more or less easy to get. But when they influence rates, they have something called the Fed's fund rate, and they basically set a target rate for that. So what do they want the cost of money to be, essentially? Like how easy or hard do they want it for people to get money? And that's kind of the rate, yeah. Stupid question. How does the Fed have so many people working for it? Don't they, like you you kind of alluded to it, that I guess one, one lever or tool in their toolkit is to move that single number up or down each period but what else do they do? What are those other tools that they have? I think you mentioned like they can deploy cash from that bank account to basically make things easier or harder to buy. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully I did an okay job explaining it. But you have the Fed funds rate and they don't directly like set that rate. They have a target range. So right now it's 5.25 to 5.5%. Mm-hmm. Percent. And they'll use the other tools in their toolkit to get to that range to like keep things ah, in between. Okay. Really the primary lever for monetary policy is banks. And so they have things like the discount rate, the reserve requirement that influence how difficult it is for banks to loan money out. So a higher reserve requirement would mean that banks have to keep more cash on hand, more cash in their reserves. They're not going to be loaning out as much money. Discount rate is the borrowing window between banks and the Fed. And so if that's higher, you know, banks aren't going to loan out as much money. And then there's open market operations, which is when the Fed is buying or selling different securities. But the main thing to know about the Fed funds rate is that is the rate that the Fed influences to determine, you know, if you go and get a loan, if you go and get a mortgage, is it going to be an expensive mortgage? Is it going to be 8% like it has been? Or is it going to be lower? And so that's just influences the prime rate in the economy, which is what the banks all do. And so that's the Fed's monetary mechanism. Yeah. Simplified, wow. reductive. No, yeah. that's way more dynamic than I thought. And I feel pretty yeah. stupid to say that I thought that they were actually determining the rate, not influencing it. No. And I mean, I don't think that's stupid at all. I think that it's confusing. Money is is weird in general. So I don't <laughs> think it's, it's stupid to think that yeah, at all. Can you explain what fractional banking is and, and why it makes the economy go faster. I mean, like in the back of my head, I think about fractional banking as a way for, it's a big reason why the US economy, I think, has taken off faster than others because we have that in place and and we've had a bit of a looser policy than, than other countries. Well, it actually goes back to the goldsmiths. So I think it was like during the 1800s, don't quote me directly on the time, but the, you know, the goldsmiths were like, oh man, we have all this gold, like people are just keeping it with us. And why don't we give people a little certificates to represent the gold so they don't have to like carry on these gold bars. Then they figured out that they could like charge yield on that sort of thing. And then the people would go out and exchange their gold certificates. And that that's sort of how fractional banking came to light was through the goldsmiths. And it's sort of similar in the economy now. So banks loan out more than they have on hand. The whole idea is that people all won't come all at once to try and get all their money back a la Silicon Valley Bank. But yes, fractional reserve banking is a really dynamic way to get a lot of money out into the economy for sure. And the banking business model is really interesting because it's essentially, you know, the government saying, everybody, you can trust these guys. You can trust these banks. Like the banks have a pinky promise with the government that they're not going to go and blow up the financial system. Yeah, the FDIC pinky promise. So I have $100,000. I put it in the bank. The bank only has to keep like 10% of that on hand, right? It depends on the reserve requirement. Yeah. If the reserve requirement is 10%, then yes. It went down to zero during the pandemic because they really wanted people to loan out mm. money, the banks. So, And then you come into the bank and you ask them for a loan and they give you money, but then you might put some of that money that they loaned back in for a while and then they can also loan off of that. So it's kind of like this domino effect, right? Where they're creating mm-hmm. more money that can go to work in the economy that I don't know. In my mind, I almost feel like it's almost fictional money that they're creating. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, technically, one could argue that money multiplier, things like that. There's there's a lot of dynamics to the banking system. 
Kyla, can you explain why a linear increase or decrease in the Fed funds rate, it'll create like a non-linear change in the economy? So in other words, like going from 2.5 to 2.75 can cause, the way I understand it, potentially a much larger unwinding than say going from like 1.5 to 1.75. Why is that relationship non-linear? I mean, it's just how the economy responds to certain things. I think the one dynamic that people will compare it to is like gasoline prices. So it's like falling like a feather, rising like a rocket with gas prices. When they rise, they skyrocket, right? Like it's a, there they go. And when the price of oil rises, the price of gasoline will rise in tandem. They're both kind of skyrocketing. But when the price of oil declines, the price of gas does not decline as quickly shooting off like a rocket, falling like a feather. And when we think about lowering or moving around interest rates, it just depends on how big the move is perceived by the markets. But the example that you brought up specifically, there is a little bit of a difference when you're kind of below 2% or above, I suppose. But yeah, I I don't... That one is a little harder to answer. Yeah. 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 But it's just how the dynamic works. The word you use is perception. That's interesting because it is a lot of what people perceive the current economic situation to be and how they react. Yeah. In terms of gas prices or just in general? Just in general. I mean, like with the Fed's fund rate or anything that's changed, how big of a jump they perceive it to be and how that impacts their daily lives. Well, and so one thing that everyone has been really struggling with is these consumer sentiment surveys. And consumer sentiment is heavily influenced by gasoline because when you drive around, it's like a giant neon sign, right? Like you're driving down the highway, which, you know, that's all that America is, like a network of highways, and you just see like (laughs) gas signs. And so that's like a very visceral experience for people. And now that gas prices have started to go down again, consumer sentiment sentiment has started to go up. And so really it is as simple as like just have lower gas prices in some instances to make people feel better about the economy. But the Federal Reserve, yeah, like the rates are a little bit different than than that. Yeah. So I read all the consumer sentiment surveys, but no one's ever called me and asked for my sentiment. Have you ever Uh, got hit with a poll? No, I mean, it's crazy because with the University of Michigan, they only poll 600 people. (laughs) And so pretty small end to make a decision. We're extrapolating for sure. And people aren't responding because like I reject all unknown calls from my phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. And so the sampling bias is wild because then you only end up getting people who answer their phones. And that tends to be an older demographic who have mixed feelings about, I think, everything. That definitely does have a sampling bias. I mean, even when they show uh, like political polls of who's ahead in the polls of like, I've never gotten a call. But now that you say it, it's because I don't pick up my phone if I don't know the number. Yeah. And the survey response rates have dropped down to below 40%. And same with that. one of the main labor market surveys is something called JOLTS, the Job Opening Labor Turnover Survey. And this is what the Federal Reserve looks at to make sure that the labor market is doing okay. This is what economists look at to make sure the labor market is doing okay. And it's survey-based. It's the Job Opening Labor Turnover Survey. <laughs> and so employers huh. are not responding to that as, as much as they were. And so now we kind of have this weird perception of the labor market just based on survey responses. And so surveys are really important, but there's a lot of bias, as you know, that's like just hard to escape from. Kyla, how is the unemployment rate calculated in like a basic way? Is is that based on surveys of like, are you employed right now? Or is it by like people putting in for unemployment with the, the state they live in? Yeah, yeah. So the unemployment rate is the number of unemployed people over the labor force. There's a lot of technicalities to like what exactly is unemployed. And there's the unemployment rate isn't perfect because it doesn't capture people who are underemployed. So who might be like a PhD working at a Starbucks, right? Like they have a job, but they don't love it. It doesn't capture, I think like issues with like part-time work. If you're a part-time worker, but you want to be full-time, like that's not really captured by the unemployment rate. There's actual ways that are not survey-based that we capture those metrics, like unemployment filings and things like that, that we can get a better sense of. But a lot of people argue that it's not very good for figuring out the stance of the economy just because of it doesn't have a lot of nuance to it. And the unemployment rate lags, right? So it takes a while for people to catch up to actually get signal from it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like most economic metrics at this point is there's a a little bit of confusion about when it's useful to look at it, when it's not. For the labor market, Employee America is a really good think tank who does a 
really great job at like covering the specifics of the labor market. And they argue that quits rates are actually very important to understanding the labor market because if people feel like they can go and quit their job, that means that they're like things are probably going pretty well, right? Like if you feel like you, you don't can quit to get a worse job, right? <laughs> no, you quit because you feel like you have an opportunity and you can get a bigger paycheck somewhere else. So that's what they look at to figure out the strength of the economy. And the Federal Reserve has started to shift in that direction too because you just get a better sense of the confidence of the worker and then also how tight the labor market is if people are quitting their jobs that means the labor market is pretty tight yeah that means it's a relatively strong labor market and i look at the numbers relative to the tech market just because that's where i work and the attrition rates are actually going down like people who self-select to leave companies because they don't want to leave a decent thing they have, even if it's not their favorite thing because of all the layoffs that are going on. So they're staying longer at the jobs because they don't know what could happen. Yeah, tech is an interesting industry. They're one of the loudest industries. So I feel like we hear like media loves to talk about tech. That's such it's a like- good point. But it's actually a very minority of people who work in that oh, in the yeah. country. Oh, yeah. And like, it's not really that emblematic of the overall economy. One could argue it's emblematic of the stock market. But like, when tech is talking about layoffs, that is a different situation <laughs> than the overall economy. It's still very sad and it sucks that people are losing their jobs. But tech is not the economy. I'm wondering if we could talk a bit about the relationship between the Fed and startups in particular. And I'll point out two changes that I've noticed, and maybe you can tell me if you agree with them or if I'm missing anything else that's that's a big theme here. But one is that I'm getting more money on my savings balance. So I'll raise money from venture capitalists I have it in the bank, and now I can hire suddenly one or two more developers per year off that interest rate, which is nice. And then two, the valuation multiples I get applied to my revenue are less because the interest rates went up and it flows into their DCF model, et cetera. What else do you think is going on with the Fed in particular, and like you said, influencing rates that that impacts this tech world or, or startup world. Yeah, the multiple slashing is something that we hear a lot about. And then higher savings rates is another thing that's a benefit of higher interest rates. But yeah, I would say like there is the idea of a tech session <laughs> uh, where there's a recession in tech. I think that tech has been flying high for a while And so when you think about how the Federal Reserve impacts tech specifically, you know, tech does not love higher rates. A zero interest rate environment is preferable. And when I say tech, I I mean like maybe companies that aren't hard tech, maybe more soft tech companies, a zero interest rate environment is not that, that beneficial for them. And during the pandemic, there was a lot of money floating around. And so the tech companies hired, they hired a bunch of people, they maybe overhired. And I think you're starting to see the impact of that and the layoffs. Hey, thanks for listening. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Reduce burn, extend runway, do more with less. Operational efficiency. These are all catchphrases that we know all too well because of the headwinds business leaders face in today's growth environment. Growth is now a battle, not a breeze. While teams are on the front lines fighting every day for top line yardage, there are hidden savings opportunities right beneath their feet. That's where Tropic comes into play. Their procurement platform brings order and process to a historically decentralized and chaotic business function purchasing and supplier management. Tropic serves as the front door for procurement that your entire company will want to use. By combining intake forms, pricing benchmarks, approval workflows, and supplier management all in one place, Tropic makes savings opportunities easy to find and act on. When you pour blood, sweat, and tears into revenue growth, doesn't it make sense to protect what you have fought for? Visit tropicapp.io, that's tropicapp.io, to learn how modern businesses are controlling spend to extend their runway. Your board will thank you. Your budget will thank you. Your bottom line will thank you. There are a lot of startup CFOs listening to the podcast, and I think the Fed just announced that the rates were going to change but go in the other direction. What would be your first thought or reaction if you were a startup CFO? Would, would there be anything oh. you're like, oh <laughs> shit, now I got to adjust? <laughs> that's like very outside of my core competency <laughs> <laughs> to be a startup CFO. I don't think that's something I've ever thought about. But um, yeah, I mean, so the Federal Reserve at this meeting this week, they didn't come out directly and say that they were going to cut rates, but like there's 75 basis points of cuts priced in for next year. The market freaked out. They were like, oh my gosh, buy up crypto coins all over again, you know, pump the NFTs. Yeah. 
but there's no guarantee that they're going to cut rates. But the New York Fed president came out, John Williams, and he was like, oh, guys, like, chill out. We're not going to be cutting rates. Like, calm down. So the Federal Reserve is just trying to do uncertainty management right now. But I think for startup CFOs, we are probably going to enter a world where rates do begin to lower. And the reason that the rates are lowering is not because the economy is bad. It's because inflation is basically where the Fed wants it to be. We're not at their 2% target yet, but we're getting much closer. And so for them, they just want to make sure that it's not a restrictive environment. So if rates are higher than the neutral rate, they're going to cut rates. But if rates are lower than the neutral rate, which would be an accommodative environment, that's not good either. So they're trying to find like this Goldilocks um, rate in the economy where things are just in maintenance mode. It's funny because you're saying that they were trying to not damage control, but they were trying to kind of reword what they had put out there. Why do they have to talk in such confusing speak? Because the markets are very reactive. Like, you know, we talk about the Fed's toolkit, rate hikes, balance sheet. And then the other thing is their credibility. So it's very important that people trust what the Fed says, because if the Fed comes out and they're like, oh, everybody, like maybe we're going to cut rates and then nobody believes the Fed, that creates a really tough environment for them to operate proper. And half of the time, monetary policy is influenced by literally like the tie that Jerome Powell is wearing. And so financial conditions, one of the worries is that when the Fed begins to cut rates, that financial conditions will ease. We're already kind of seeing that in markets, you know, bond yields begin to go down. It's becoming an easy environment again, and that could become inflationary. And so the Federal Reserve is just trying to prevent an easy financial condition environment, which could lead to inflation, which could make them have to hike rates yet again. So they're just trying to cap out on all of that. It's so funny because I have seen memes about like what tie he was wearing that day and like what message he may be trying to signal. Yeah, it's definitely like Fed PSYOP. <laughs> yeah. It is kind of like a lesson in game theory because sometimes I'll read it. Yeah. I'm like, this is the most boring shit I've ever read. Like, And also it's kind of like a haiku that I don't understand. But I guess yeah. every word that you're saying is kind of chosen carefully. Oh, totally. And like if he's – there was this one time that somebody, a reporter, falsely told Jerome Powell that – the markets were rallying during a press conference and the markets weren't really rallying. But once Jerome Powell heard that, he was like, they better not be. And it's just kind of like everything is designed around, it's it's the markets versus the Federal Reserve. And one thing that with Williams coming out today, they had to make it very clear to the market that the market is not going to like boss around the Fed. The market flips out. It's like very dumb. It's just, you know, it's human emotions packaged into money and stickers. And so I think that they just want to make sure that the market understands the Federal Reserve is going to be in control of the train ride, right? I love how you said it's human emotions packaged into money and tickers. That That's an accurate description. Yeah. I mean, the stock market is, and I get yelled at sometimes for this, but like the efficient markets hypothesis like isn't real, right? The markets are not rational. And I think we saw all that with the GameStop AMC thing. Yeah. Um, because of more passive indexing, you do have just like money flows that make it so it isn't so volatile. But at the end of the day, like these are people. (laughs) Yeah. How could it be a truly efficient market if it's people behind it who have emotions? Like we're not robots just making binary decisions. Yeah. And you do have like the high frequency trading desks and those sorts of like the red max of the world. Got it. And uh, I I was reading a piece that you had written and you talked about the revaluation of labor. I was curious, Uh could you explain what that means? Yeah. So that's what I was sort of referencing earlier in the podcasts around like the Bloom and Onion story is that we're starting to see a world where certain types of work are valued higher maybe than other types of work. So like obviously tech is still going to be very important, but we're seeing lower income wage workers, lower wage workers get pay raises. And part of that is because we don't really have people who are flipping the burgers. Like we kind of need, that's why when you go to your local burger flipping place they're like we'll pay you twenty dollars an hour to flip these burgers it's because there's high demand for these jobs that people don't really want to do and there's like a whole conversation to be had about like what's going on with with those sorts of jobs but now we're starting to see those jobs begin to get paid more and that bleeds into the price of the goods that they're making right so like if your burger flipper gets paid more your burger is probably going to be more expensive and so we're kind of seeing that revaluation of labor. And then now it's like 
in certain tech companies, there's so many different jobs that are getting paid so much money that maybe yeah. shouldn't be. And we're kind of seeing that fallout happen too. It's so true because I'm a big Dunkin' Donuts guy. You can see the Dunkin'. Uh, I hope yeah. they sponsor this podcast someday. Shout out Dunkin'. Cool. But like over the last six months, whenever I go in, it's like the signs that they have asking for people to work. They're getting like louder. And I think the signs are bigger, but they're also saying like offering this much. And I've noticed the amount they're offering to the workers that is going up. Yeah, it is because that's what happens when supply and demand is out of balance. Yeah. When you do not have the proper amount of workers for the job, you have to pay them more to incentivize them to come and do the job. And yeah, yeah that's what we're seeing. All right, Kyla, I want to move on to what we call our long ass lightning round. So first question I have for you is which chairman of the Fed do you think could do the most push-ups in their prime? Probably Volcker. I just feel like the way that he commanded the room was was pretty impressive. I don't think Bernanke or Greenspan. Yeah, I would say Paul Volcker. Nice, nice. Yeah, but you know, so this is maybe not fair. But the original founder of the Fed was the original J.P. Morgan, like the J.P. Morgan of J.P. Morgan Chase, like the, the J.P. Uh, Morgan. Yeah, yeah. So he was the guy who had been saving all the banks during the panics of the late 1800s, the financial panics. And he was the guy after the 1907 panic who was like, I'm really sick of bailing out all these banks. Like, let's get it together, everybody. Like, let's go make a Federal Reserve. And so he was never technically a Fed chairman, but I feel like he could do a lot of push-ups. Yeah. Just looking at him, he just looks like very dense. Yeah. <laughs> Tries and buys type of guy. Mm -hmm. So I, I was doing some research on Jay Powell. Jerome Powell reportedly makes 190000 per year. Doesn't that seem low to you considering he can control or impact the entire world economy? Maybe. Yeah. His net worth is north of $5 million, I think. He, has, he founded a consulting firm, I think, gotcha. and like went to law school, had been a lawyer. But you know, it's public service. I think the president makes like 400k, something yeah. like that. And so, yeah. it, you know, you don't become Fed chair to make money. <laughs> you could easily get a job in the private sector that would pay you a bunch of money and probably give you a jet. But you do Fed chair work because you're wanting to do public servant stuff. Yeah, that's a good one. What type of lunch do you envision Jerome Powell eating every day? I kind of think of him as like a strict turkey and cheese guy, but like without condiments. Oh, really? Uh, you know, I've never met him, uh, so I'm not sure. I know that he likes the Grateful Dead, so... Really? Maybe, yeah, the chairman he's a of huge the Fed's fan. a deadhead? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And the And the cyclist, yeah. I feel like what kind of lunch... I think he likes salads. I could see him being kind of like a salad guy, like a light salad. Like a sweet green kind of guy? Yeah, maybe not even that. Just something simple. I got to ask, you're pretty active on Twitter. Did you see that commercial that Coinbase recently <laughs> came out with? Was that depressing uh, as hell or what? Okay, so, so like I think 10 people sent it to me. Oh, really? I yeah, thought it was going to be original by asking you No, this. <laughs> no, I, I haven't watched it because like I have a rule that if enough people send me something, I probably shouldn't look at it <laughs> just because it's going to be something that bums me out. So I haven't taken a look at it. I do know that one text was like, they're talking about demographics in here. <laughs> and I was like, I, I don't know what that means. So I haven't seen the video. Can you describe it to me? Yeah. So basically they go through three generations in the same family <laughs> and they say like, this person took out a loan, went to college, started a family, bought a house. This person took out a loan, went to college, bought a family, started the house. And then it goes to his daughter. <laughs> and it's like, she took out a loan, went to college, took out another loan for the next degree. And now she took out another loan to basically pay off the interest on the first loan. And she can't buy a house because rates are so low. Therefore, you should invest in crypto to make a new world. That was the takeaway? Y yeah, that, that, was, that was the commercial. Oh, <laughs> they were like, crypto will save you. They're like, they're like oh, the okay. system's fucked. Like, try this, try this other one. Oh, dang it. Oh, no. Okay. I mean, so I used to work in crypto, and I still think like the technology is really awesome. I think it's been co-opted by the worst possible people in the world, though. <laughs> like, you know, FTX, what happened with Binance? It just attracted a lot of grift. And I think that in order for crypto to save people the way that this Coinbase episode or TV show is talking about, it's going to have to be different than how it is. Like nobody really knows the purpose of Bitcoin. Like, is it meant to be a commodity? Is it meant to be a dollar? Like, is it meant to be a speculative tool? You can't 
act like something is going to be something that you can transact with and then be like, you better hold on to those coins, dude. Right. Like, that's just not going to work. And then the question is like, is it Ethereum? Like is Ethereum the right choice? Maybe. But like what's up with those gas fees? And so I think crypto just has a lot more to figure out. And I think it's awesome that we're trying to re-envision the financial sector. I think that's super important. And I think that as you know, like finance is just a gate kept industry and it doesn't need to be as dumb as it is. But I don't know if crypto is going in the right direction to be the solution to somebody not being able to afford a home. Like those are systematic issues. Yeah. And I think it's kind of irresponsible of them to be like, crypto will save you because you still have to live in the world. I don't know. That was more ranty than I intended, but I, I guess it. I have a lot of feelings. But I loved it. I don't and know. What, it's made, just what made me frustrated with crypto is because I did take some. So there was this YouTube series that Gary Gensler. Yeah. I think he used to work for the Fed, right? He, he is the chair do, of the SEC. A, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I forgot what he did. He yeah. did this class at Harvard and it was 23 lectures. Yeah. And so I didn't pay to go to the course or anything. I didn't get a certificate, but I, I watched all 23 of them. I just had my first kid at the time and I was on paternity leave and whenever I was giving her a bottle, I put on one of the sessions. And so I went through all 23 and I was like sold on this being a cool technology. But then the reality in the world was that like the greatest use case is arbitrage on top of the coin or crypto that you already have. So it's like, I think the underlying tech is cool, but like you said, you have to actually use it for something in the real world. It can't just be like a derivative of itself. No, and it has to like have real world frameworks too. Like, you know, BlackRock is very, Larry Fink, I, I think he loves crypto. Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan was like, the government should ban crypto. Like, I don't know. It's just, they're just silly. And I know no hate to the industry because I think they're trying their best in some cases, but you can't be everything. You have to pick a lane. Yeah, it can't be everything to everyone. Okay, bit of a different question. So I love your writing. Who are some of the writers that you respect to or look up to online? Thank you. I appreciate that. There's an author called Jennifer Egan who wrote okay. A Visit from the Goon Squad. I really love her work. She kind of writes about like sci-fi dystopia in a really cool way through short stories. I think she does a very good job and I really enjoy all of her stuff. And then I've been reading this book by Benjamin Labatou, I think his name is. It's called When We Cease to Understand the World. And that's been really enjoyable because it's about like Einstein, like all of these guys that got really close to the sun, like they they got real close to like seeing into the depths of the universe and how that kind of broke them. And I feel like that Whoa. is just, a, it's, it's a very cool book because you're learning about like the darkness that exists behind some of these top technologies and then, yeah, like basically everybody I follow on Twitter, I love all the things that they write online too. Like uh, Joey Politano has a great newsletter about the economy. He's super knowledgeable about the labor market, just an incredible person. Claudia Sam of the Sound Rule, she's an incredible person as well. Like I could go on and on about who does good writing. Yeah. Thank you. You gave me a new reading list for the weekend. Advice to people thinking about putting themselves out there publicly and creating content. <laughs> advice. Uh, nothing is advice. It's just thoughts, you know? So I've been doing this for two years now, which is like really cool. And like, I'm so grateful. But if you go back to my old videos, it's like really funny because you could just tell I was incredibly uncomfortable <laughs> and yeah. didn't really I like did not want to be talking at that camera because there's something weird about just like, because I filmed a video this morning for my YouTube and there's something very weird about just sitting in your room, like talking to yourself. It is so weird. Like even yeah. like on a micro level, I do the monologues for before the podcast just yeah. to say like, hey, here's what I talked about. And I feel like a psychopath talking to myself yeah it, and I think that's like a big part about putting yourself out there is you have to get over like this internal weirdness that exists with creating content you have to not be so worried about what people are going to think about you like people are going to judge no matter what and sometimes it's nice to have the haters because they'll retweet it and they'll be like this idiot and but you're yeah. getting attention right yeah. like all press is good press but yeah I would just say like if you feel like you have something to say the world probably deserves to hear it and you should go on and say it. Yeah. I think it was Anne Lamont, really great writer. She said like, if there's a story out there that nobody's written yet, then you have to go write it yourself. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we're in the middle of this passion crisis and it's funny when people think about art, like, and I don't know if video creation and content creation online is art, but 
it's increasingly seeming like people feel like they have to be like Olympic level quality in order to produce any sort of art or any sort of content. Like I have to be the absolute best at it, but you're not like, it's going to take time. And like, I still have so much to learn, obviously. So you just have to be like patient with yourself and patient with the world around you as you try stuff out. And sometimes it's not even about having Olympic quality content. It's just creating a skew that's like a one of one. Like I think your content's amazing. And also there's no one else doing it with the same tone that you're doing it in. So it kind of separates you from the pack. And I think a lot of people out there, they try to almost write or create something for like this fictional person. It's like, no, just Mm -hmm. be yourself and write it how you would want to consume it. Yeah, I think there's like a lot of value to authenticity. And one thing that's cool about the work that I do and like what's really fun is like, a lot of people in finance don't really make jokes or in the economy at large. And so there's a huge opportunity to like try and be funny and like do skits and explain things in a really human centric way. And yeah, I don't know. What are you working on and where can people find you if they want more? Oh, oh gosh. Um, I'm working on a book. The book is called In This Economy. It's available on Amazon as well as Penguin Random House's website. I also have a newsletter, kyla.substack.com. I'm a YouTube channel and then a TikTok, Instagram, YouTube shorts at Kyla Scan on Twitter at Kyla Scan. Hell yeah. Five stars. Follow. Read the book. Penguin (laughs) Random House. That's legit. Congrats on all the success and thanks so much for the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Roll the credits, producer Natalie. Run the Numbers is part of the Turpentine Podcast Network. It is produced by Natalie Torrin and edited by Justin Golden. Album artwork by Some AI Thing. Yelling an intro by Fat Joe. If you made it this far, please give us five stars. I really need this.